thank you, Roy, for everything. What y'all didn't catch was Roy played an extra verse while everybody ran forward. I thank you for that, Roy, very much. This morning, come on up here, Susan. This morning, I got some announcements for you, and we're going to play a new game called Stump Dr. Susan. <laughs> some of y'all got to meet Susan Arnold several times. She's been here with us this year. It's third or fourth time here with us now. I came when you came for onboarding. Oh, that's right. It's like you're, you've been here a lot. <laughs> and um, we give thanks to you, Susan. Today, you're going to take a few minutes and teach us on prayer. You, are, Whether you want to admit or not, she is the conference expert on prayer right now. And um, I'm really impressed with her. She does church growth and prayer and has this amazing real realization, the more we pray, the more churches come alive. So we're going to play a couple games this morning. Susan, are you ready to play Stump, the Stump Dr. Susan? I think I'm ready. Are you all ready? Okay. Next Sunday, we are having an Easter egg hunt. Now, before the Easter egg hunt, there are going to be all sorts. There's going to be food and pizza and there's going to be live animals. I understand we're going to have bunnies and goats. So, Dr. Susan, which one do we pet first, the bunny or the goat? Well, because I have goats at my house, and I love goats, I would have to say goats first. Goats first. Okay. All right. Next Sunday is also Palm Sunday. And because, I, you know, I've read my Bible. It doesn't say just the kids got to wave palm branches. Everybody got to wave palm branches. So next Sunday, everybody gets a palm branch. Now, my question is, do you wave your palm branch with your left hand or your right hand, Dr. Susan? I would say you wave your palm branch with your non-dominant hand because then you have to think about what you're doing for Christ. This is the broken hand, Susan. <laughs> it's non-dominant hand. <laughs> okay, she's getting too smart. And she is talking like a doctor, isn't she? Okay, now... Tuesday night, we're coming back here at 6.30, and we're going to have a question and answer time about the church potential study. And they're going to ask lots of questions. Mm -hmm. Susan, if I, you know that game, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? You used to have that thing you could call phone a friend. Yes. Could you, would you be my friend? I would be your friend. I'm your friend even if you're not doing the church potential study. <laughs> okay, thank you, And Susan. you can phone me, text me, Zoom me. I will answer. Email me. I will answer. I okay. will be your friend. Thank you very much, Susan. By the way, if you did not get a copy of that report and would like to get one, Brenda, wherever you have hidden off to now. <laughs> She's in the back. She's in the back. Uh, has two more copies available. If you're really nice, she'll sell you one for $100. Four. Or, she has four. Four. She has four copies. She has four. I thought she was saying $400. <laughs> she has four copies still left there. Okay. Finally, Susan, we have Holy Week coming up. That means Monday, Thursday, which is on a Thursday. Monday means new. It's a last. I have no idea why I use so much Latin. Anyway, it's, it's a great service. It's a really powerful service. It's going to be at 7 o'clock on the 28th, the 29th. It's Good Friday, which is always interesting why it's called good when such bad things happen. But sunrise service is going to be at 645. Now, Susan, you are a Bible scholar. So I'm going to ask you which of the Gospels. Let me just give you some pressures here. Um, Mark says it was very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise when the women came. Matthew says after the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week. John says early on the first day of the week while it was still dark. And then Luke says on the first day very early in the morning. So Susan, question number one, what day of the week did they go to the tomb? You get seven choices. All right, I got seven choices. Well, my first question is I'm wondering if it was daylight savings time or not. <laughs> You know, it you matters do. when dawn is based on if it's daylight savings time. Well, the good news is because we've already gone through that, we get to sleep an extra hour. I know, that is good. I like That's that. the one good thing about daylight <laughs> savings time, okay? So, so which day of the week did they come? So scholars say Sabbath would have ended on Saturday, and then they are beginning to look to the dawn of the new day, which would be Sunday. So if you look at all of the Gospels, they all hold the answer Sunday. Sunday. Now, they all say they came on Sunday. There is a difference. Now, there's some disagreement at what time. Our sunrise service is at 6.45. So which version of the Bible are we, which, which, which book of the Bible are we following? I follow them all. What about you all? They agree with all of them. All of them are good. So when we meet at 6.45, that's going to be before dawn, mm -hmm. which is what one of them said, because dawn's at 7 o'clock. And it's going to be last until 7.30, so which is after sunrise at 6.28. So we're going to get them all covered, aren't we? Okay. 
Well, Susan, it's great to worship with you here today at Berks United Methodist. It's going to be a fantastic day, and I praise God so much for you being here today. Thank you. Thank All you. All right. Okay. Our call to worship at this time I invite you now to join with me. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. For the Lord is a great God and great King above all gods. We are his people, and he watches over the flock under his care. Amen. Now is the time for our, our prayer of confession and reassurance. You don't need to stand quite yet. 
Uh, but good, good, good training, well done. I would invite you all to pray along with me, the words on the screen. Compassionate Lord, forgive us when we falter on this Lenten pathway, when the road ahead seems too uncertain and we are afraid. Jesus requires us to be willing to make the ultimate commitment of our whole lives and we hesitate and hold back. Draw us back to you, Lord. Give us confidence and courage to face the future with hope. Let us place our trust in you that the message of peace and mercy you have given to us through Christ may be offered to others through to your healing mercy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Even though, oh, is this still mine? Even though the future is clouded, God is with us, guiding, healing, comforting, restoring. Rejoice in the name of Jesus Christ. You are forgiven and healed. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven and healed. Amen. Looks like next on the, on the order of worship is the passing of the peace. It is St. Patrick's Day, regardless of what color someone's wearing, no pinching, please. Offer each other signs of peace. Start it up. Sky that happens to 
Thank you. You may be seated. Appreciate our band today. We have changed members every week just to confuse you. We even brought someone back from the dead. Matt Kelly, it's good to see you. And uh, all right. At this time, a good friend of mine, Susan Arnold, is coming forward. I forgot how many years ago it was, Susan. It's been at least 12, 15 years ago. She left teaching, and then I kept hearing these rumors of this church up in Kingsport. A church we call Shades of Grace today. A sh a church for homeless people I'm thinking yeah that's gonna succeed we'll have about 10 people that thing that's they're now in their fourth building I think something like that there and you were the one I kept hearing whispers about that was making everything in the background happen and made that church what it is today and ever since then I thought Susan is the girl she is the lady who God uses to do great things so Susan come on up here and teach us a little bit of prayer this morning So good morning, Berks United Methodist Church. Thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for the way you worship, the way you are making disciples, and the way that you bless this community. Um, we appreciate you as part of the conference staff. I want to say thank you for all that you do and for who you are. And thank you to um, your pastor, Brian, who you love. Amen. Yeah, I think that deserves a clap. Yeah, I think he can have a clap. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity to come and to share a little bit about my passion. You see, when I began my call to ministry, I was an elementary school teacher 
with a husband and four young children. Um, and the question that started my journey into ministry was, I, I, I had taken my children back to church because they needed to go to church, right? I didn't need it, but they needed it. The truth was I needed it too. And the question that was stirring in my heart as I went to church was, I would listen to the pastor pray. I'd see the people in the pews praying. I had no clue at what people were doing when they were praying. And so my question was to the pastor, Pastor, what is it you do when you pray? And he was like, well, that's a great question. A lot of people have asked me a lot of questions, but I don't know that anybody's ever asked me that specific question about prayer. I get a lot of questions about um, what do you say during prayer? I get a lot of questions about what do you do with the things you receive in prayer? How do you pray for somebody else? He said, but I've not really ever had anybody challenge me with the question, what is it you are doing when you pray? And that began my journey um, into ministry. It began my journey of trying to understand this beautiful, mystical gift that God has blessed us with that we all call prayer. Now, it's a pretty simplistic question, is it not? What do you do when you pray? Well, we, we watch the pastor pray on Sunday mornings. We hear uh, Sunday school class teachers and friends pray for us. And I want you to think about who it was in your life that taught you what to do when you pray. Just think about that just a moment. Across your years, um, no matter how young you are or how veteran you are, thinking about who is the person who walked alongside of you and really taught you what to do when you're praying. For me, it was my grandmother I probably would not be here today had it not been the prayers of my grandmother. I lived life pretty wide open and had a really great time while I was doing it. But she was faithful and fervent in her prayers for all of her grandchildren. And I can remember watching her read scripture and, and begin to pray and to pour out her prayers. But I began to be curious and interested about prayer there. But it was in my 30s when I asked the pastor, what in the world do you do when you pray, that it really began to unfold. How many people had a grandparent teach you how to pray? Yeah, I was an elementary school teacher, so this will be participatory, by the way. <laughs> how many people it was a parent? Sunday school teacher? Youth? Youth leader? Yeah, there's our youth people. Um, pastor, you know, have pastor teach you to pray? Sure, sure. Small group leader, friend. Yeah, all sorts of people have taught us how to pray. But that brings me to the question, what do we do when we pray? Across scripture, we've seen prayer. We've seen um, Noah and Moses and Miriam and Deborah and Hagar. We've seen prayer across scripture. We can look back historically and see prayer across historically um, Susanna Wesley held a prayer meeting in her kitchen that was larger than the uh, worship service that the rector was holding and he got really mad and sent a letter uh, back to Susanna's husband and said she has to stop this because this service is outgrowing what I'm doing at the church. Um, luckily she said no. <laughs> but it was a prayer meeting, right? Bishop Desmond Tutu said this about prayer. Prayer is like coming into the presence of God and sitting at a warm fire and letting it begin to warm your heart and warm your mind and warm your soul and will help you be a glow as you walk away from your time with God. I love that image of sitting at this holy fire and allowing it to warm our hearts and our minds and our souls. So the one question I want to dig deeply on today about prayer is, how do we listen in prayer? How do we listen? Prayer has many, many parts. It's uh, many parts, but we're going to focus on the how do we listen piece of prayer. Because as a pastor, that's the number one question I get is, how do you hear God's voice? 
I don't think across my entire life I've ever heard God's voice, Pastor. How do I hear God's voice? And we know it's biblical to hear God's voice. We can go back in and look at 1 Samuel and begin to see the story of Samuel and Eli, right? And the young boy awakens to this voice that keeps calling his name. And he knows, he knows Eli so well. He's like, oh, it's got to be Eli. And he wakes up and he runs in. And he, he says, Eli, Eli, what, you're calling me. What is it that you want? And Eli's like, I'm not calling you. I've not said anything. And I wonder if he was just a little bit foggy and sleepy. And he's like, oh, but wait a minute. If it's in the dark of the night and you're sleeping and somebody's calling your name and it's not me, then it's got to be the voice of God. And he sends him back. And he says, go back. And when you hear the voice again, say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Can you say that with me? Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. There's some opportunities that we can glean from that small component of Scripture right there. And it's true across all components of Scripture. Is that if you're going to want to hear the voice of God... First, you've got to go back and be available, right? He couldn't stay there with Eli and have this conversation and wait on, the, wait on the voice. Eli sends him back to be available and present. So the first part of listening and prayer is being available and present. He also then says that to listen. He tells him, listen for the voice to call you again. And when the voice calls you again, he, he gives him this invitational response. Say back to it. Speak, Lord. Acknowledge it's God. I am listening. I am ready. I am here. And as he does, the voice of God continues to unfold. We see that when the archangel comes and visits Mary. And in scripture, that was God's messenger, God's voice to Mary. She was available. She lent herself to listen. And she received what it was the voice of God said. And so this morning I thought we would do a little experiment. Is that all right? Are you game for an experiment? Okay, some people are like, yes, sure, we're, we're game for an experiment. Here's how the experiment goes. We're going to practice this morning actually being present, actually listening, and actually receiving what it is God's voice would say to us today. And I, if you were like me, when I first started, I was like, I don't even know what I'm doing in prayer. It's okay, show up, be available, listen, be present, and receive what God offers. It's, it's, that's, we're just going to boil it down to those simple kernels today. And oftentimes, we are asked to pray for other people. And what a holy gift that is to get to pray for somebody else. And oftentimes when we're asked to pray for other people, they give us a laundry list, don't they? I'm going to have this, 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 and this happen, and I need you to pray this, 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 and this. Right? Okay, I'll pray this, this, and this. We're going to try something a little different today. What I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you with somebody you're sitting near that you, you know... Okay, so we don't have to worry about finding somebody you don't know. Somebody you know that you are near, and you're just going to sit with them, and you're going to ask God, God, would you give me a word for Brian? And then I'm going to be real quiet, and I'm going to listen for just a little bit. And while I'm doing that, Brian's going to say, God, would you give me a word today for Susan? And we're just going to both be real quiet, and we're going to listen. And as we listen, sometimes you might get a vision. Sometimes you might get an image of something in your head. Sometimes God might give you a word or a phrase or a symbol or song lyrics. Sometimes it's that still, small voice inside. It doesn't always have to be a loud, booming voice, although God does still speak in loud, audible, booming voices. So if it happens to you, do not freak out. God can do that, okay? But we're going to do that this morning and just try that and see what we hear or see what we see that God might be speaking to you about someone here. And if you're online, then I ask you to think about somebody that you are worshiping with right now or somebody that you pray for on a regular basis 
that you would ask God what might God have to say for that person, okay? All right, so the task will be find somebody. If you're sitting near somebody, that works great. Don't leave anybody alone, even if you have to make a group of three. Ask in prayer, God, what would you say for or about? And then pause and listen. And then we'll debrief that together. Okay? Any questions? All right. I have a limited time I'm allowed to talk this morning. So um, it, <laughs> so that you can get to lunch and all the other things you want to do today. So go. Find somebody to, to pray with. All right, now, we've had a little bit of time just to practice. To practice praying for someone and to listen in for what God might share and what God might say. Um, is there anybody here that would be willing just to share a short little bit about what they heard, either what you heard God say about the person you were praying with or what the person said to you? Just a few, just a few. I'll share this one. We'll just stand you with one. Okay. Oh, I prayed with Brett, and um, he led our song a few minutes ago. And Brett and I don't know each other very well, but um, I know this is a new experience for him leading worship here at our church. I think last Sunday might have been his first. And so I just said, God, God laid on my heart for him to be courageous because I love to sing, but I don't really feel comfortable leading worship. So I'm thankful that he does, and I'm also thankful Matt's here too. But um, but he prayed for peace for me, which he has. He doesn't really know me, and that is just God's word. That's all I can say. So would you would you say Amen? Amen. It's two people that don't know each other very well. They don't know each other's history, and God gave each a word for one another. That's amazing, isn't it? Where's Kelly? All right. I'll come back to you. They probably won't be able to see us on the live stream. They'll think something really weird has happened, but I'll come on back to you anyway. How's that? 
Do you mind? Okay. What do you want me to say, Andrea? Did you? Oh, yes. I, um, I ask God, what w would you have me to say to Carol? Yes. She is a worthy woman. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. One more? All right. I prayed for my sister, Susie Huber, and I prayed the Lord to, for the Lord to bless her. And he gave me a word for her, which is so true, giving. She's the most generous, giving person I know. And if I could squeeze in one more, I prayed for my brother, whom I love very much. And the Lord gave me godly. Mm -hmm. He's a godly man. Thank you. Would you say amen? amen. All right. So um, here's what just happened. We heard God's voice. Not once, not just one person in the, in the worship space, but several. What do you think it would be like if people knew God spoke at Burke's United Methodist Church? Do you know what the world is hungry for? It's not great music, although you have it. It's not phenomenal preaching, although you have it. It's not warm, welcoming people, although you have it. Do you know what the world hungers for, church? The thing they're aching for and the thing that they long to feel is the closeness and the presence and the voice of God. And that just happened here. Don't miss it. It just happened here on a Sunday, ordinary, well, it's St. It's Patty's Day, so a little extraordinary day. But it happened here. And it wasn't just the preachers that heard God's voice, although we did, and we prayed for one another. It was all of us. So I want to encourage you. That when you leave here this day, matter of fact, I don't even going to wait for you to leave. If you Instagram or if you're on threads or if you're on Facebook, I say you, you post right now. Is that all right, Pastor Brian? That you post right now, we heard God speak at Burke's United Methodist Church. If people think you're crazy, let them come figure it out. Tell them you'll be glad to walk with them and you'll be glad to show them because you know what? There are people in this space today that have never heard God speak. And the reason I know that is I got to be 30 years old and God was probably speaking all along, but I just wasn't, I didn't have the practice and the equipping to receive it, but you do now. And so as a disciple of Christ, our job is to multiply and to share. And so I want to encourage you not only to let people know you heard God speak at Berks United Methodist Church today and God is speaking in powerful, profound ways but then I want to encourage you as a disciple of Christ to teach somebody else this week how to be present, how to listen, and how to receive and share what God said. That can be scary sometimes, especially when you don't know each other well, right? Like, I don't know what God's to say. God gave me this word peace, and I really don't know, but it's okay. You don't have to know. As you saw our friend, she just lit up, right? When she was like, he doesn't have any idea, but God knows what that means to me. And so that's homework. As a good teacher, you always give homework, right? So you got two assignments. Share with somebody about how Burks has heard God speak this morning in profound ways. And then continue to share and teach other people to hear the voice of God. I suspect that Eli realized it took practice. So that's why he didn't do this for Samuel. He sent Samuel back to practice hearing the voice of God on his own. And so the third piece of homework is continue to practice this week. Continue to ask God. When people ask you to pray, pray what they ask and then ask God what else God might say about 
what you're you're praying about. So I um, commission you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to be disciples that go out and teach others how to hear in prayer. Amen? Amen. All right, Pastor Brian, I'm passing it back. As our band comes forward, this time, actually not our band, we got a duet out now. I'm going to sing one of my favorite songs, Be That My Vision. As they're coming, I give thanks for Burks. Because, you know, Burks does amazing things. Do you know in the last month, you all gave away $13,000? You're like, eh, it's not that much. Yeah, it is. We're on track to give away $120,000 this year. It's a lot of money, folks. We're giving it away to folks who need it in our community. We're supporting missionaries around the world. And even some of it goes to Susan, too, to keep her doing her good ministry. Well, because I believe in what you're doing. And I think it's amazing that our church can do that sort of stuff. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you today. I thank you for using us, Lord. Thank you for speaking here in our midst today, Father. Thank you for speaking to us. And now we pray as we give to you, Lord, and hear this music that we may hear you again. Amen. Still be 
Please stand as you're able for the reading of the scripture. This is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 33 through 37, and verse 42. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the way they'd argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me but the one who sent me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you all. You may be seated. Susan, when you introduced me, I said, get a, a, you all appreciate Pastor Brian. What they were holding back for was Deanne, because I know they love her more than they love me. It's okay. I love her quite a bit, too. She is not with us today. She's at the annual minister spouse's retreat. And about 25 years ago, she said, either you let me go or I'm divorcing you. So she's at the minister's spouse's retreat. She'll be back tomorrow, actually this afternoon sometime, after her car's full of stuff from Pigeon Forge. So... Um, Amy, I'm going to jump around a little bit today, okay? So good luck. Susan said, I can either preach for you or teach. I said, Susan, I need you to do both, but I need to preach a Sunday because I've, this text today is the one i got to deal with because I need to keep working on this one because it's how to be a disciple. And there's stuff in here I want to skip over. Jim, there's parts that passage I know you read the Bible but there's parts I wish we could change okay because they're not always easy stuff now I was this week for some reason I got intrigued by what it takes to get a key to the city of Chattanooga I don't know why it doesn't open anything it just looks cool right it just looks cool so I started researching the last two years everybody's gotten a key to the city I found out something if I was a rock star, if I was a rapper, if I came and sang some great songs, I would get a key to the city. If I spent 50 years doing some work here in Chattanooga, I could get a key to the city. Or I can go on eBay and buy one for $35. <laughs> that's, the, that's the one for sale on, on eBay right now. You can have it today. It's up to you. The question I'm struggling with is, what does it take to be a disciple? I know what it takes to get a key to the city of Chattanooga, 35 bucks. But something tells me there is a whole lot more involved in being a disciple for Jesus Christ. Three times in Mark, chapter 8, 9, and 10, Jesus tells his dim-witted disciples, I guess he was getting a head start on me, that he's about to die. And he talks about how he's going to be betrayed and die. And, oh, by the way, he's going to raise, be raised on the third day. They don't get it. And after each one of these teachings, he goes on into a question of what does it mean to be a disciple? Now, along the way, they have, the disciples at this point have just made a 100-mile journey by foot. And Jesus has the audacity to ask them what they're arguing about. I don't know about you, but if I walked 100 miles by foot and I was heading back to Hickson, back to home, here are some things that be in my mind. Where are we going to eat tonight? <laughs> I like some Italian, but they haven't discovered tomatoes yet, so I'm not sure about Italian. We could have some Greek food. I like Greek food. That'd be good. And you know, we're going back to Capernaum. I know what we're going to have fish yep we're gonna have fish that's all you eat in Capernaum well they might be arguing about why did we come I mean all we did is we walked over here to the Decapolis we healed somebody we went up here to Tyree and Sidon and we healed a little girl we walked all the way up to Caesarea Philippi and Jesus asked 
Who do you say I am? And Peter said, the Messiah. We could have asked that question in Capernaum, you know. There was no reason to hike 100 miles to heal two people and ask a question. We could have done that right here at home. Jesus, why did you haul us all this place? Oh, yeah, we did the Mount of Transfiguration. And guess what? Peter, James, and John got to go. The rest of us had to sit at the bottom of the hill. Why did we have to go hike 100 miles? The three of them, the nine of us could have stayed at home. I don't know, John. Jesus. What do you think we're arguing about? John's, G, Judas is over here complaining, you all got it easy. I got to carry the money bag. They haven't invented, invented visa yet. Do you know how heavy these coins are? Matthew's over there saying, I don't know what you guys are fussing about. I'm the oldest one among you guys. My feet hurt. My hip hurts. I had a nice sit-down tax collecting job. And now I'm out here walking hundreds of miles. But what they're arguing about, you know, is who's the greatest? Who is the greatest? Of the 12 of us, when Jesus comes back and we are in a time of glory and the Romans are kicked out and we're all following Jesus, who's the greatest? When Jesus gets in to Capernaum, he takes them into a private home and they gather around and then it says he sat down now if I, after I walked 100 miles I'd sit down too but there's a reason he sits down in those days a rabbi taught from a sitting position kind of like most preachers use a pulpit or most teachers use their little desk and they wrap on their desk that sort of stuff You've got a place of authority. And for Jesus, he was a rabbi. And he sat down. And he called the twelve to him. And he said, I need to teach you something. It's time for a lesson. Are you ready to listen to the lesson or not? Whoever wants to be first must be last and be the servant of all. Now some of you all are saying, Preacher, that's the exact same thing you preached last Sunday. I know it. Last week we said deny yourself. This week Jesus is saying be a servant of all. Maybe it's because I need to hear the lesson. Maybe it's because Jesus is saying, do you get it yet? What I'm really looking for to be a disciple of Jesus Christ means you have to to be a servant you have to say everybody else comes before me this week it's been interesting I've got seven fingers at work do you know how much fun it is to button buttons with seven fingers it took me 25 minutes this morning to get my shirt buttoned and I never figured out how to get the top one buttoned that's why I'm wearing a robe today Susan I want to cut my top button up and even then I had to have Susan tie my shoe because it came untied it's no fun having somebody else serve you. It's embarrassing to say, I need help. So we don't want to ask for help, do we? But my guess is you know a lot of folks that could use a little bit of help today, don't you? And what would happen if we served them? What would happen if we actually helped them out without humiliating them, without torturing them? What if we just took care of the folks around us? But Jesus wasn't done preaching yet. He took up a child, and according to one verse, he put him in his lap, and when he just put his arm around him, it all kind of depends on how you read the scripture. But anyway, he takes a child and puts it among them. Now, let me take a little digression here. I don't know what your kids do for fun. I have a nerd son. And this week, he was quoting all the Aramaic written in the New Testament used by Jesus. If you, for those of you who are not as nerdy as my son are, they took Hebrew, and then about 500, five, 600 years before Jesus, they kind of made, created a new language called Aramaic, kind of where we get Arabic from, and it's kind of a cross, it's a modern Hebrew version. And that's what people spoke in his days. They spoke Aramaic there in Israel. There was also Greek and Rome and Latin. But he normally spoke Aramaic. 
And so every now in the scriptures, we have these phrases like, Eli, Eli, Lamach, Shabbat, Tanai. Yeah, that sounds good, doesn't it? A Talithium, Kahum. Or Raka. And he was muttering these things at the table one day with some strangers. And they were giving him the biggest strange looks. Like, what in the world are you doing? I share that with you because intriguingly enough, in Aramaic, the word for child is the same word for servant. And so when Jesus takes a little child among them, he's not saying, hey, look, look at how cute this kid is. My grandkid did this coolest thing yesterday. It has made me laugh all morning. He crawled inside a bag and giggled and rolled around and crawled back out. It was great, okay? It was even better in pictures. Jesus is not saying he's a cute little kid. This is a kid who you call servant. They're the lowest. I mean, they're down there in the pecking order. They don't have any rights. You can do with them whatever you want to. They're there to take care of things. They're there to do the dishes, take out the trash, do all that sort of stuff. That's their role in life. And Jesus says, I need you to be like a little child. I need you to be the one who does all the chores nobody else wants to do. I need you to be the one who comes along and says, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. You see, Jesus was trying to teach us that day. He was trying to teach his disciples who just didn't get it. It's time to deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow me. It's time to quit trying to be the first and be the last. Be the servant of all. Let me conclude with one little piece of history for you, okay? I see a number of you all have green on today for St. Patrick's Day. I realize for most folks, St. Patrick's Day is a reason to drink green beer, wear funny hats, and be weird. It's really kind of embarrassing to think that's what St. Patrick's turned into. When he was a teenager, Patrick was stolen and made a slave in Ireland. He was captured, turned into slavery, and worked as a slave for a number of years. Learned Irish learned their customs and all those sorts of things, experienced a little bit of God while he was there, and then he had a chance to escape. And he took it, and he ran away and went back to England and became a preacher, a priest. And then at the age of 45, he said, God has laid at my heart to go back to Ireland to minister to those folks. And the bishop in the cabinet said, Susan, that's fine. Mandatory retirement's 45. You've already hit it because we know you're going to die any day now. So if you want to go finish the last days of your life in Ireland, go for it. And so he went back to Ireland. There was no expectation from him to do anything because as far as everybody in England was concerned, the Irish were the worst of the worst of the worst. Their dogs, are, they said, we treat our dogs better than we treat Irish folks. If you want to waste the rest, last two or three years of your life working with them, go for it. Who cares? They're not worth ministering to. He went. He did a really strange way of ministering. He and his, those who followed him would go to a city in Ireland, little small towns, and they would set up on the side of town, and they would begin to live the Christian life in such a vibrant way that people started coming over and saying, what are you doing? And who is this Jesus you're talking about? And who's God and who's the Holy Spirit? And he held up a shamrock, a three-leaf clover, and said, you know, they're all one, aren't they? Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, they're all one. And before long, the town would believe in Jesus. And he'd go to another town and do the same thing again. And then another town, and another town. A hundred years later, after Patrick finally dies and everything else happens, the country of Ireland sends out Christian missionaries to all of Europe because by that point, Europe had quit believing in God. And the Irish people, who everybody said was not worth anything, became the folks who spread the good news of Jesus Christ back across Europe again. 
because they realized that somebody was willing to be a servant of all and come and talk to them that nobody loved and transform them. Could God be doing the same with us? Could God be using us today to transform the world? As the band comes forward, let's pray. Lord, I give you thanks today that you are using us. And Lord, it's no fun being a servant, God. It means doing things nobody else wants to do. It means doing embarrassing things sometimes. And it means getting down and getting dirty. It means putting away our pride and saying what's best for the community and not what's best for me. And Lord, I'm lousy at it. Would you come change me today, Father, and use this church for your glory? Amen. Let's stand for our last song. to this place and I will drown inside your love until I see your perfect face and I thank you Lord and I from the rain, breathing life into this place, and I will drown inside your love, until I see your perfect face, wash it all away. Drown inside your love until I see your perfect face. The blood of 
Thank you. I'll play you out. <laughs> I'll just play. Uh... All right. So may you go in the fullness of God. May you go in the presence of Jesus. And may you go in the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen. You make oceans from the rain. Breathing life into this place And I will drown inside your love Until I see your perfect face You make oceans from the rain Breathing life into this place And I will drown inside in love Until I see your perfect face